Good morning, afternoon, or evening. How y'all doing today? Welcome back to Mr. Morrow's Math Corner. Today we're going to be talking about radicals, guys. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff, and we're going to go through it rather quickly. But remember, you could always pause, rewind, and rewatch. So we're going to be talking about radicals today, guys. And a lot of times people think that radicals and square roots are the same thing, and uh, technically they're not. Um, square root is a type of radical, okay? And a square root, guys, square roots have two real roots. We talked about this in Chapter 10 when we were solving quadratics. There's always two roots to a square root, a positive and a negative. The positive root or the principal root, guys, okay, will be just the positive square root of n, where n is any real number. The negative root, guys, or its opposite, will be the negative of that square root, all right? If you remember, when we're solving, if I have x squared equals 9, and I use a square root to solve, remember that my answers will once again be in plus or minus. Why? Because the positive side will be talking about the principal square root, okay? And the negative, we'll be talking about the negative or the opposite root. So square roots have a plus or minus. Now, radicals in general are described right here, guys. When I have, it's called the nth root of A. N here is what's called the index, guys. That's the index. Okay? The index tells you how many of the same value I need to pull one of those values out? The index tells you how many you need to pull one out. And we'll talk about that. But we have talked about that before already, so that should be a little reminder. The actual sign itself, guys, the actual symbol, that's called a radical sign. And the number inside of the radical is called the radicand. Please note that there, if there is no index, if it is blank, such as right here, that is a square root, okay? When the index is blank, there is an imaginary 2. And once again, that tells you that I need 2 of the same value to pull one of those out. So if you think about this, 81 breaks down into 9 and 9. And by the law that I just described, if my index is 2, well, I need 2 of the same value to pull one of those out. So a 9 and a 9 will come out as 1, 9. And hence, the square root of 81 is 9. Please note, my friends, that the square root properties, every positive real number has two square roots, okay? A positive and a negative. So, for example, the square root of 64, both positive and negative roots of that will be positive 8 or negative 8, okay? The square root of 0 is 0, and this is important. For any real number where a, in this case a is the radicand, is greater than or equal to 0, the square root of a squared equals a. What does that mean? That means that when I raise a square root to a power of 2, they both cancel, guys. They both cancel. So the square root of 16 squared they cancel, it equals 16. The square root of 7.5 squared, they cancel, equals 7.5. Simplifying square root radicals, guys, is very easy, very, very easy. If you know your perfect squares, remember that a perfect square is a product that came from multiplying a number or variable times itself. For example, the square root of 25 is 5 since 5 squared is 25. They're opposites, the reverse of each other. Now, I would strongly suggest that you memorize these 
perfect squares. It's going to make your life a lot, lot easier. And let me give you a quick example of how much easier it would make your life. Let's say I tell you I want you to simplify the square root of 128. Well, I know that's even, so that's 2 and 64. Hey, wait a second. Square root of 64 is 8, so this is immediately 8 square root of 2. You're done because you knew the square root of 64. If not, you'd have to break down the 64 into all of its primes, and then one by one, every pair comes out as one of that value. Okay, in order to evaluate a square root, simply ask yourself, what number times itself equals the radicand? Think about it. You're looking for pairs, guys. And if you know your perfect squares, this is going to be a breeze. Square root of 49 is 7. Why? Because 7 times 7 equals 49. There's an index of 2 here. It's invisible. So I'm looking for pairs. A 7 and a 7 comes out as a 7. 64 will be 8 because that's a perfect square that I memorized. But let's say you forget. Well, you got 2 and 32, 2 and 16, 2 and 8, 2 and 4, and 2 and 2. So, a 2 and a 2 comes out as a 2 times. A 2 and a 2 comes out as a 2 times. A 2 and a 2 comes out as a 2, which equals 8. But it's a lot easier to know your perfect squares. The square root of 4, 36, don't let this stress you out. This is just the square root of 4 divided by the square root of 36, which will equal 2, 6, which when then reduced will be 1 third. Square root of 4.3 squared, those two bad boys cancel, and you're going to be left with 4.3. Negative 5 times the square root of 81. Well, the square root of 81 is 9. So negative 5 times 9 is negative 45. Square root of 4 is 2, plus the square root of 64 is 8, so that's going to be 10. Whenever you have operations inside of a radical, think of the radical as a parenthesis, guys. you got to do whatever's inside there first. So this is the square root of 9 plus 16 is 25, and now the square root of 25 is 5. Sometimes people will go, oh, the square root of 9 is 3, the square root of 16 is 4, so that should be 7. No, that is wrong. you got to first do what's inside first order of operations. Just like for number H. This is the square root of 64 minus 4 times 7 times 1 is 28, and that is going to be the square root of 36, and the square root of 36 is 6. Bada beam, bada boom. You're done, baby. Woo! Let's move on. Okay. How to determine if a, if a square root is rational, irrational, or not a real number? My brothers and sisters out there, a rational square root is a perfect square, such as square root of 9 or square root of 144. If it's a perfect square, that means it equals a real number. That means that it's rational, okay? Square root of 30 is not perfect. Square root of 42 is not perfect. Irrational square roots are non-perfect squares. If you put that into your calculator, the decimal just keeps going on and on and on forever and ever. So non-perfect squares are irrational. And if the square root, okay, if you have a negative inside the square root, well, then that's not a real number. However, I taught you guys about imaginary numbers in chapter 10. So if you remember, the square root of negative 1 equals i. So you have this negative 1 in here, so this is immediately going to be 2i. Moto y 2i. Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of negative 1 is i. Okay. Here, I don't have a square root of 15, but I do have this i, this negative square root, so this will become i times the square root of 15. 
if I were to simplify them, but those are not real numbers. When you have a negative inside of a square root, those are called imaginary or complex numbers. Okay? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Let's do this. Okay, now we get to the good part. All right. So we've been talking about, about uh, simplifying square roots. Now, what happens when n is something other than 2, guys? Okay, when it's not invisible. When you have an actual n there, a 3, a 4, a 5, a 7, a 12. Well, a couple things. If n is odd, okay, if my index, guys, my n, my index is odd, there is only one real root. It could be positive or negative. It doesn't matter. If n is odd, there is just one real root. The cube root of 8 is 2. The cube root of negative 64 is negative 4. There is no plus or minus for odds. However, if n, the index, is even, brothers, even, okay, then remember, you're going to have a positive root or a negative root. The square root of 9 could be positive 3 or negative 3, depending on what root they want. When b is negative in a square root, remember that there are no real even roots. Those are my imaginaries. And when b is, is negative, there is only one real root for odd indexes. For odd indexes, you can have negatives inside. The cube root of negative 8 equals negative 2, because negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 is negative 8. And you can use radical signs, guys, to indicate a root. The number under the sign is a radicand, and the index gives the degree of the root. Just another little reminder, okay? We have my index. That tells you how many of the same value you need to pull one out. We have the actual radical sign, which is the symbol, and what's inside of the radical sign is called the radicand. Remember, if there's no index, it's blank. That means there's a 2. If my n, my index, is greater than or equal to 2 and even, the radicand must be greater than or equal to 0. If it's negative, then it's an imaginary. It's not a real number. We can work with it, but it's an imaginary. If n is greater than or equal to 3 and odd, then the radicand can be any real number. Let me repeat that. If n is greater than or equal to 3 and odd, then the radicand can be any real number. Okay? So square root of negative 4, that's 2i. It's not a real number. That's imaginary. But the cube root, or let's change it up here. Let's put the fifth root, the fifth root of negative 32 will be negative 2. Because negative 2 times itself 5 times will be negative 32. Okay? So odd indexes, you can have a negative radicand. Even indexes, you cannot. They will not be a real number. When you're finding real roots, guys, of a number, use the index to determine how many values are needed to pull out one of that value. For example, cube root of 64. Well, guys, this breaks up into 2 and 32, and then 2 and 16, and then 2 and 8, and then 2 and 4, and then 2 and 2. Now, if I'm dealing with a cube root, I'm looking for three of the same value to pull one out. So a 2, a 2, and a 2 comes out as a 2 times. A 2, a 2, and a 2 comes out as a 2, which equals 4. Okay? Now, what's the cube root of 8? Well, you should know by now that it's 2, but why? This is 2 times 4. 
4 breaks down into 2 times 2. I've got a cube root. My index is 3. I'm looking for sets of 3. So a 2, a 2, and a 2 comes out as a 2. I'm done. Boom. 200. Well, that's 2 times 100. And this is where knowing things helps you. Hopefully you say, wait a second. Square root of 100 is 10. So this is simply 10 times square root of 2. Fourth root of negative 1. This is not real, guys. It's not real right now. That is not real. Okay. Square root of negative 2 in parentheses squared. Let's see what's happening here. This is the square root of 4 because negative 2 squared is 4. Now, you may say, Moro, can't you cancel out this guy with this guy? Not technically because this is negative in here. Okay? That's negative in there. So you have to first use order of operations and square what's inside that radical. So negative 2 squared is 4. Square root of 4 would then be 2, and that would be my answer. Now, you may say, Moro, shouldn't it be plus or minus 2? No. They'll tell you out here, if they put a plus or minus to begin with, they want both roots. If they just want a positive root, it'll just be blank. If they want a negative root, you'll have a negative sign. Cube root of negative 27. What I like to do always is anytime I have a negative inside of an odd index, the first thing I do is take out the negative. Why? How? Because negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. So I pulled out a negative 1. And now I can work on my 27. This is 3 times 9. 9 breaks down into 3 times 3. And then a 3, a 3, and a 3 comes out as a 3. And bada beam, bada boom, I'm done. I'm sorry, that will be negative 3 because that negative 1. Sorry. Fourth root of negative 8. That's going to be not real. It is not a real number. It's not a real number. Okay. Now... Let's see if you guys remember the trick for variables. When we're dealing with radicals, okay, and you have variables inside, guys, it's very simple. Simply divide the variable exponent by the index. The whole number of times that it comes out, that goes outside of the radical. And whatever remainder or leftover you have stays inside the radical. So for here... I got the square root of 16, x to the 8th. Well, square root of 16 is 4. Remember, there's an invisible 2 here. 8 divided by 2 is 4. Goes in evenly. No leftovers. Done. Cube root of a to the 6th, b to the 9th. 6 divided by 3 is a squared. 9 divided by 3, that'd be b cubed. The fourth root of x to the eighth, y twelve. Eight divided by four, x squared. Twelve divided by four, y cubed. Square root of eighty-one x to the fourth. Square root of eighty-one is nine. And the square root of x to the fourth, there's a two there. Four divided by two, that's x squared. And let's give you one that doesn't go in evenly, real quick. What if I gave you uh, the fifth root of, let's say, x to the ninth, y to the seventh, and w to the eleventh. Okay. Nine divided by five. Five goes into nine one whole time, but I'm going to have four x's left over. Five goes into seven one whole time, but I'm going to have two y's left over. And five goes into eleven two whole times, but I'm going to have one W left over.
And that should help wrap things up here pretty quickly here, guys. Okay, we're almost good. We're almost done. And then last but not least, you can write a radical expression, guys, in an equivalent form using a fractional or rational exponent instead of a radical sign. In general, the nth root of x equals x to the 1 over n power. Let's think about this before you stress out. n is the index, and this x has an exponent of 1. The way you write this is the radicand, which in this case is x, raised to the exponent of the radicand divided by the index. That's it. That's how you write it. Okay? That's how you write it. For example, square root of 36 is, remember there's a 2 here, there's a 1, so this is 36 to the 1 half. Cube root of 64, remember there's a 1 here, my index is 3, so this is 64 to the 1 over 3. 4 through to 16, there's an exponent of 1, so this is 16 to the 1 fourth. Now, what happens if it gets a little complicated? This first one we already saw. This is, for example, like let's say the square root of 7. That equals 7 to the 1 half. Done. What about this next example, though? This would be something like 3, the cube root of 2 to the 4th power. Check out, guys. This is the exponent. This is the index. So this will be the radicand 2 to the 4 thirds. And then when it's negative, guys, just remember that when you have a negative exponent, just like before, you got to bring it to the bottom. Okay? And then from there, you can make your conversions. For example, convert each into radical form. Well, this is the seventh root of x cubed. Remember, this is the exponent of the variable of the radicand, and this is the index. Y to the negative three fifths. First of all, I'm going to go one over y to the three three point five to make it positive. Secondly, I'm going to go seven halves. Okay. And then thirdly, this is going to be one over the square root of y to the seventh. And then fourthly, this is going to be 2 goes into 7 three times. So this is y cubed where the square root of y left over. Look at what I did there, guys. I'm from negative exponent. I brought it down. to the, I'm going to make it positive. I converted 3.5 to 7 halves. Then 2 is the index. 7 is my radicand's exponent. Then I simplified this. The index of 2 goes into 7 three whole times. That means I pulled out 6 y's. I have 1 y left over. Next, w to the negative 5 eighths. That's going to equal 1 over w to the 5 eighths, which is going to equal 1 over the eighth root of w to the fifth. I can't take out any w's. I don't have enough w's. I only got five w's. So I'm done. w to the point two is w to the one fifth, which is the fifth root of w to the first power. Again, I cannot simplify because I don't have enough w's. Now let's convert each into an exponential form. Remember that there's an invisible uh, index here of two. So this is a to the 5 halves. B, let's go parentheses first, guys. This here is y to the 1 fifth raised to the 4th power. Remember that when you raise a power to a power, you multiply. So this will be y to the 4 fifths. Oh, yeah. The fourth root of x cubed, well, that's going to become 
x to the 3 fourths. And the fifth root of b cubed, that's going to be b to the 1 fifth raised to the third power, which is b to the 3 fifths. And my brothers and sisters and all of you out there watching, thank you so much. Hope you learned a lot. And I'll talk to you on the flip side. Be well, guys. Bye-bye.